And so when you find a great mobile home park or, or even a great parking asset in a very strategic location and a growing marketplace where the demand is increasing, it's going to be very challenging to ever replace that particular asset. And I feel very much the same about these, these build to rent properties that we're building. And so while I'm not going to say that we'll never sell any of these developments, that is not our intent. Our intent is to actually build to hold and, and ultimately you know, build a portfolio of these strategically located infill locations and, uh, and build a portfolio out of it. And so um, not saying that we might not flip one out to, you know, to an institution to lower our basis overall, but generally speaking, we're looking at a 10 year horizon here. Welcome to the How to Scale Commercial Real Estate Show. Whether you are an active or passive investor, we'll teach you how to scale your real estate investing business into something big. Kevin Bupp, welcome to the show. Sam, thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Hey, man, the pleasure's mine. Appreciate you coming on today. There are three questions I ask every guest who comes on the show. In 90 seconds or less, can you tell me, where did you start? Where are you now? And how did you get there? Yeah, fantastic. Uh, started about 21 years ago. Started buying a single family fix and flip properties. Did a bunch of wholesaling as well. Built up quite a large portfolio in my early 20s, of about 130 single family rental homes and a few hundred multifamily doors. Wow. Fast forward to today, um, been a full-time investor for two plus decades. I've owned pretty much every different asset type out there, um, you know, office, retail, industrial, self-storage, medical office. Um, you know, today we are primarily focused on three different sectors of our business. One being manufactured housing, which we've spent the last decade in. Uh, the second being parking investments, which we've been in for a few years now. And then the fourth and, and, and probably the uh, one of the most exciting ones that we're currently involved in are built to rent projects, uh, more specifically built to rent projects in urban infill locations in Phoenix, Arizona. That's a lot of moving parts. You're well <laughs> known, obviously, for your podcast on mobile home park investing. Uh, and I think you, you run two different shows, don't you? There's a real estate investing for cash flow and then I, I do. We have a mobile home park specific podcast as well. I don't. I don't post any new episodes. I haven't for a few years, but we've got okay. a you know 150 or so up there, and it still just kind of does its thing. <laughs> gotcha. But, yeah. Okay. Very very cool. I mean, mobile home parks has been a hot asset class. Can you kind of give us, uh, you know, and maybe and maybe maybe that's uh, to, to to some degree, you know, due to you, you know, kind of advertising the uh, the asset class. But I mean, tell us about it. Where where has it been? Where is it now? And you know, where do you see opportunity on that front? Yeah, that's it's a great question. You know, it's funny. My my business partner always kind of jokes with me that you know we probably did train some of our competition. We were the first podcast out there, and right. you know for m many years we were the only. Inf you know, there was a little bit of other information out there in the marketplace, but you know oh, we wow. were the only podcast really speaking about it, and you know kind of sharing techniques and strategies. And it's you know it's a it's an asset class that has a diminishing supply, and so there's a there's a massive supply demand imbalance. You know, the demand has, um, you know, significantly increased over the last five plus years with, uh, you know, just a number of larger institutions and private equity investors trying to really pour billions upon billions of dollars into the space where they had always overlooked historically. Right. And so there, you got all this money trying to come in, no new supply come on the marketplace. And it's just, it's created just a severe imbalance. And so, you know, we started buying parks 10 years ago, and you know, back then it was it was very mom and poppy, which there's still aspects of that today. It's not fully consolidated, but it's I tell you that it's racing towards consolidation pretty quickly. Uh, so ten years ago, where we might have been, you know, the only bidder on a deal, or maybe there's you know one or two others, we'd have you know had a much easier time of winning an opportunity back then than we would today. And so you know, they're they're trading at all time low cap rates. In fact, Green Street data showed that uh, at some point during the middle of the pandemic, you know, multifamily had always at least over the last decade, it's always it's it's been the the asset class that has traded at the lowest cap rate um, historically, at least for the past ten years. Mobile home parks actually took over multifamily as far as uh, you know where the average cap rates are trading at, and it was it was sub four level for a period of time, wow. and they're still pretty much they're down there today. You know the. Um, the institutions are just trying to gobble up as much as they can, and uh, ultimately, it's uh, it's it's made it a little more challenging for investors such as us. You know, uh, you know, I guess you could say smaller, medium sized investors. And uh, you know, I I don't necessarily have a cost of capital that would allow me to buy a, a stable four cap property that doesn't have upside. Um, however, institutions they've got different sources of capital that you know, typically is much cheaper than that of of retail capital. And so, there's still deals out there, as you know. You just got to pound the pavement more. You've got to you know turn over more rocks and find those needles in the haystacks. And, uh, and they're there and we find that we just don't necessarily find it as many as we might have found uh, years prior. 
Right. Yeah, I think that's uh, that, that's that's a really good synopsis there. I appreciate you taking the time, you know, to share on that. I mean, as as anybody says that that if, if anybody says that there's no deals out there, then uh, they're probably right. You know, because that's uh, <laughs> <laughs> tell me about this though. I mean, you guys have found some other asset classes, and I, I especially want to hear uh, you know what you guys are doing on the build to rent. That's your that's your latest and, and greatest kind of foray. Why do you see opportunity there? Um, you know, just talk to us about that if you can. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. And you know, I, I will say that you know we're we're the we're the type of group that we really like to we like to stay in our lane. You know, yeah. I, we we don't like to be everything to everybody. I think that you lose focus and uh, you, you you dilute your 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 you know your strength in any particular asset class when you're you know getting pulled in a million different directions. And so, you know, we had focus solely on mobile home parks literally for for seven years. That's all we did. We just kind of ignored all the other noise out there, you know, there's a million and one different ways to make money in real estate. And we, we chose that lane and we wanted to be the best at it. Um, parking came uh, across our, our radar screen uh, about four years ago. It took us uh, a few years before we even dove into that space. And that, that space is a little different. You know, it doesn't necessarily, as far as the operational side of it, we don't have a vertically integrated, uh, a vertically integrated property management company for the the parking sector. We just work with you know, local and regional operators and in, in whatever particular marketplace we own in. And so, while there's asset management involved, we're not necessarily having to hire a lot of uh, a lot of in-house employees to run that side of our business. And so, it's not set it and forget it, um, but it's not as operationally intensive as as mobile home parks. And again, we took a couple of years of really understanding that asset class before we dove into it, and really the same. The same is true with 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 build to rent, and you know, at the end of the day, build to rent it's residential, right? I mean, it's 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 residential housing, and you know, it's it's similar to that of of, of single family rentals. It's similar to that of multifamily apartment complexes. It's similar to that of, of mobile home parks. It's just a different form. It's purpose built, you know, residential housing. And so, the projects that we have working in Phoenix are are, are for. Uh, urban info locations. Uh, these are, you know, main main on main locations, irreplaceable locations, walkable to all the nightlife restaurants. Um, just locations that 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 you know don't run the necessary risk of of being on the outskirts of when the music stops. Right. Mm. We've got a massive shortage of housing right now. The music is going to play for for many years to come. Uh, the, the the data will show that like. Anywhere between four to five million, uh, you know, homes that we're short at present time, or residential units that we're short at present time, and we're not nearly producing enough to ever catch up to that anytime soon. You know, again, data comes from all different streams, but one would say that it's literally going to take us ten years to even truly get caught up at any at any pace whatsoever. I mean, we're literally we're still falling behind at present time, right. and so you know, we love Phoenix. I mean, Phoenix is just a, it's a very dynamic marketplace. You know, a lot of Fortune companies there and moving there. It's a very diverse local economy as well. It's very different than what it was prior to the Great Recession. It's kind of I like to compare it to Florida. Like Florida is a very different state than what it was prior to two thousand and eight. Prior right. to two thousand and eight. It wasn't very economically diverse. It was heavily weighted in the construction side of things. So when we had an oversupply of homes and the music kind of stopped down here, a lot of those jobs, those folks that had no jobs anymore in the crushing field moved away. And so we had a we had a population actually moved away for a period of time and and ultimately an excess of housing. Hey, that's a very different case. And the same goes with Phoenix. And so just super excited about those uh, those properties. And and again, really, I think one of the most exciting thing about built to rent is being able to actually purpose purposely build a product today for long-term rental uses not necessarily taking a townhome that was built to sell and then you know converting it into a long-term rental and so we're putting a lot of thought and energy and focus into the materials that we use and the the, the overall quality of the build so that these things are durable and can withstand you know the I'm not going to say abuse cuz not everyone abuses their rentals but they typically see a little bit more abuse than a standard, uh, you know, homeowner might put on a home. Yeah, certainly. Nobody washes their rental car idea. I mean, it's like <laughs> it's sure. gonna it's gonna undergo more abuse than you know just a regular home typically. Uh, tell me, purpose built. When you say that, like, what are the things you're doing? The, what? How are? How is the build changing on a build to rent versus you know again a house that somebody's building to go on the? Open? Yeah. So just a couple simple things. I mean, even things such as like the kitchen cabinets, right? We're not literally just going to put the builder grade kitchen cabinets in. They're going to be more of a mid grade quality, you know, solid wood, something that's going to be more durable than some type of you know formica or you know I don't I don't know what they use in you know the cheap builder grade stuff. But basically, a lot of mid tier, higher tier 
uh, components, you know, even down to like faucets, uh, toilets, things that a lot of people just don't think about. A lot, you know, those types of things that we don't think about them. And that's why in builder grade builds, they literally cheap, they pick the cheapest toilets, they pick the cheapest faucets, they pick the, the cheapest flooring instead of the, the four mil flooring or instead of the six mil flooring, which they should be putting in, it's the three or four mil right. you know, thickness flooring, right? So just little things like that, that the average homeowner doesn't think about that ultimately, you know, we, we want to ensure that we're not every turn that we have, we're not going in and having to replace, you know, these types of components that ultimately become very expensive if you don't do it right from the get go. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And I'm thinking about things like, and, and I'm probably even not even using the right words here, but like when you mentioned faucets, like copper components versus plastic, it's like, yeah, this, the plastic stuff's going to break in like 90 days. So absolutely. Yeah. And that, and it does add, it, lo- it looks good when it's new. It sure does. Yeah. Yeah. But, but, but look at it six to 12 months later and you'll find that it, uh, yeah, it surely wasn't durable. <laughs> right. Absolutely. Tell me about urban infill. When you say that, is this, are you guys, you know, buying and b- building an entire neighborhood at a time? Is it one lot at a time? How, how does that work? No, that's, that's a great question. So these particular four projects I was speaking to are townhome projects. So, uh, two and then three story townhome, you know, contemporary modern townhome uh, projects. When I say urban infill, um, these are, uh, you know, the majority of these sites had something else on it, you know, an old, an old building of some sort, or, you know, maybe a few homes on, you know, a couple parcels that we've, uh, that we've combined. Um, but the average, you know, the, the, the small, the smallest size of these four projects, one is 21 units and the largest of these four projects is roughly 50 units. And so these are not, they're not full blown scale neighborhoods, but they're also not individual units as well. You, you're somewhat constricted to you know what you can build in urban infill locations because very rarely are you going to find yourself to where you can assemble you know multiple acres, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten acres in these urban locations. And so you know we're, we're talking a couple you know three, four, five acre uh, tracts of land at, at the largest. And so again, somewhat restricted to what you can actually put there. It's, I mean, that's kind of a needle in a haystack, I would think, to be able to find, you know, again, even four or five acres in, a, in an urban infill location that's not already developed or not, you know, yep. way overpriced. So how do you find opportunity on that front? I mean, is that just boots on the ground that know the area? Yeah. That is boots on the ground. Yeah. So we, we've got a, um, we've got a partnership. We, we basically partner with, he's a, a very close friend of mine. Uh, he runs a group called urban Phoenix. He's been a developer for 20 plus years mm. and, um, you know, cut his teeth and, and Manhattan for, for a decade and ultimately has been, you know, working in the Phoenix marketplace, has the relationships, you know, him to seem have the relationships. They've got the, um, the local market knowledge that's necessary, you know, to think that, um, you know, myself and my team, you know, we're not, we're based in Florida. We're not based in Phoenix. Uh, Phoenix is a, it's a very large MSA to think that, you know, we would just go there and be able to, you know, be successful on our own, I think would be, would be silly thinking, you know, it, it takes quite some time to build that, not just the local market knowledge, knowledge is one thing, but actually having those strategic relationships that are necessary and not even just with brokers, but also with the municipality you know, right. with the planning zoning boards and, and knowing those individuals. And so the team that we're working with, uh, the partnership that we formed, they've, they've been in that marketplace now for, for a decade and, um, and know it quite well. And so that's, that's a, the strategic advantage that we really have in this particular project. Absolutely. What are the compelling metrics in the build to rent space? I mean, clearly, you know, you told us in mobile home parks, you've seen them trade at a sub four cap. So there has to be some more compelling uh, kind of metrics surrounding build. build yeah. Around. You know, it's interesting. So I was just at the IMN conference down in Miami. Uh, I guess it's been about a month now. And um, you know, it's uh, lots, lots of uh, smaller time and medium size uh, investors in the residential space. However, over the last couple of years, it's it's really morphed into not just residential investments, but built to rent Lily is its own category now at these IMN conferences. And and there was a, a, a large, uh, large number of institutions being represented um, at this IMN conference. In fact, they have IMN now puts on, I think, two a year uh, built to rent specific uh, um, um, conferences. One's actually coming up in, in um, I believe it's in, in Vegas uh, sometime here in September. So coming up in a few months. But basically, the, the institutions, um, it's the fastest, it's the, literally the fastest growing sector you know, or, or asset class. And it, it wasn't even considered an asset class until very recently, literally right. over the last decade. It, it, in fact, it's still trying to, it's still trying to find its identity. You right. meet folks that say they call it build to rent. Some call it build for rent. Some, some do B4R. You know, I mean, like it's, it doesn't really even have its true identity yet. 
But what it does have is it has a, a ton of interest on the institutional side. The challenge is, is that there's not enough supply. You know, most institutional investors don't want to get involved on the development side. They don't want to be there. They want to they want to buy the product either at C of O or already occupied. They want to buy a stabilized property. And, and so a lot of them, have, they're willing to take the CFO, but there's not even enough homes being built right now for them to actually you know, fill their coffers enough. And so there's, when I say that, you know, we, we talk about mobile home parks and, and multifamily trading at just all-time historical low cap rates. Built for rent actually, you know, takes the cake there. But it's, it, it doesn't actually, it's, it's not, you know, the, the data, <laughs> Green Street and, and all the other data aggregators out there, they're following it. Um, there's, there's information about it, but not as mature as what we'll find here over the next five and 10 years as it finally gets its own identity and, uh, and truly becomes an asset class. But in any event, they, they typically trade for anywhere in the two and a half range to, you know, sub four range. So two and a half to, to four is what, you know, cap rates these things trade on. If, if, if they're being sold off, at you know at stabilized at, at a stabilized uh, period of time right and so i guess that, that's my final question is what's the exit you know for you guys on- yeah so yeah no that's a, that's a great question we're not really looking to build to sell mm-hmm. you know building in these strategic locations like you can't replace them you know so it's kind of like how i always felt about mobile home parks and we have sold mobile home parks but we know they're not making any more right and so when you find a great mobile home park or or even a great parking asset and a very strategic location and a growing marketplace where the demand is increasing, it's going to be very challenging to ever replace that particular asset. And I feel very much the same about these these build to rent properties that we're building. And so while I'm not going to say that we'll never sell any of these developments, that is not our intent. Our intent is to actually build to hold and uh, and, and ultimately you know build a portfolio of these strategically located infill locations and uh, and build a portfolio out of it. And so um not saying that we might not flip one out to you know to an institution to lower our basis overall, but generally speaking, we're looking at a ten year horizon here. Got it. Got it. Has that has that investment thesis changed at all in the last decade for you with this idea of just build to hold? Or it has not. It, it has not. But you know, things come up that ultimately uh, that that will you know maybe change uh, you know that direction of of what had initially been thought of as like we're going to hold this thing for 10 years to well maybe we should consider selling and i mean there's a litany of factors there you know just using maybe examples of mobile home parks you know buying an existing product something that was built 50 or 60 years ago you can you can spend you know months doing due diligence you can do market studies you can hire you know outside consultants and 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 feel that you have a good handle on the property but there's always skeletons that come up in a particular property it could be uh, skeletons related to the market um, skeletons related to the property itself or just you might find that you originally intended on expanding in that that particular market and so you bought this one you intend to buy three or four more but then you come to find that that's not necessarily where you want to you know place your energy and resources and so why are we why are we just going to hold this one in this one market we should sell this one out and focus our energy where we've decided that we're going to do an expansion and so again but our, our, our general thesis has not changed i mean we're long term holders and again looking at most of these assets whether it's build for rent parking or or mobile home parks I just know that there, you know, there's a, there's a, they're not building any more parking, not, not a lot of it, right? right. Uh, there's major restrictions on new parking coming to market. We know that that's the case with mobile home parks, and then these built around, at least these projects that I'm speaking to, given that they're in urban infill locations, they're already in area areas that are densely populated that have minimal land for development, and so um, I feel that they're irreplaceable, and that we'll be very happy in ten years looking back that we actually held on to them. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. And that's something that, uh, you know, we've heard that. And again, it goes back to the, uh, it goes back to your podcast, real estate investing for cash flow. I mean, that's kind of, but that's something I just keep hearing more. You know, we've seen a lot of, uh, you know, equity multiples, you know, huge IRR returns, people getting really excited about these monster appreciation plays, but I've seen even a, a, a change of tune from investors, you know, as they're reaching out and going, I just want cash flow. I just want to know that whatever we buy produces an income for an undefined period of time. Well, well, so you know, I I agree with that. And when you're continually, you know, flipping in and out of properties, you know, I, that, that's great. It produces massive IRRs, and right. you know, you're hitting home runs every time, seemingly. But it also creates challenges on the other side, right? It creates challenges for your investors. I mean, as far as you know, recapture. They've now they've got they got to think about where they're going to put their money again, right? Like, right. and that's. 
there's difficulties with that, especially with a lot of retail investors, like less sophisticated investors that they've got money to place. They don't want to be thinking about, you know, where the hell am I going to put this, you know, this hundred thousand, two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars thinking about every couple of years. And right. um, that takes work. That takes effort to do due diligence on, on your different sponsors. You know, if you're not going to stick with the same ones. And so, and it also creates, you know, uh, tax challenges as well. And so, um, I, I agree with you, you know, and, and we've done, we've tried to do a really good job over the, you know, the last uh, decade or so as we really, you know, try to form our avatar and find who our, our particular avatar is of investor, who that individual is, what are they seeking? You know, we're looking for that individual that's looking for, you know, long-term stable cash flow. They don't necessarily need to be hitting, you know, uh, 20% IRRs to make them happy. They don't necessarily have to hit home runs. They'd rather hit singles and doubles and be very consistent than that of just you know your big wins every couple of years and then having the challenge of I've got to find a replacement. I've got to find a replacement. I've got to find somewhere else to put my money and and, and making them actually have to work for their investment where their investment should be working for them. Yeah. And 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 also I think coupled with that is is when you hit those big wins, which they're fun, don't get me wrong. I love a big win, but but it also that big win comes with some risk attached to it. And I think I see a people, you know, recognizing that, especially in the turbulent times we're in going, you know what, I kind of want to de- de-risk my portfolio. I want to make sure that it produces mm-hmm. an income and then just kind of leave it, leave it and set it and forget it, you know, to your point there. And I think it depends what stage you're at with, with your, 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 your wealth. I mean, are you looking for, you're willing to take more risk today, you know, and hit those triples and those home runs to, you know, to accumulate more wealth? Are you looking just for, you know, you're not looking for a three, you know, two or 3% returns. Like you definitely want to grow your wealth still. Um, so you're looking for something that's consistent. You can get, you know, six to 8% returns in your money, or are you looking simply for the, the lowest risk investment possible and just simple wealth preservation, right? Like there's those three buckets that right. really depend on where you're at. And I think, I think most of our folks are in that middle bucket, right? Like they're looking for something consistent, maybe not just, they're not in a wealth preservation stage. They want to preserve it, but they still want it to grow as well. And, um, and, and looking for something that is fairly low risk and a great market to do it in. And, and parking, I think, uh, achieves that for a lot of people. Can you give mm-hmm. us a run through on the last deal that you guys closed in the parking uh, parking sector? Yeah, no, ab- absolutely. So the uh, last deal that we that we closed, it was a a, a multiple step or multiple prong deal, but it was a it's a parking deck. It's actually in our backyard. It's in Clearwater Beach, uh, right here in Florida, Tampa Bay Market. It's a 702 space, uh, seven story parking deck um, with 12,000 square feet of retail on the first floor. It's a block from the Gulf of Mexico. It's Phenomenal location, massive barriers to entry. They've got there's a moratorium. They literally will not allow more parking to be built on that island. Uh, this was actually a public private partnership with the city of Clearwater and a local private developer. They built it six years ago. And you know, as as these things sometimes go, you know, the the, the partnership it had strains in it. You know, the city was you know provided a pro forma of how this was going to perform for them. It didn't meet any of those metrics for a litany of reasons. Um, the private developer did quite well. They had the best floors. They condoized each floor. And so they had the best floors. They they did a good good a good job negotiating this deal on the front end. Right. Um, but ultimately the private developer wanted to you know take that money and redeploy it in another asset. And then the city just wanted they wanted to take that money and actually put it in another project because the, their return on it has been horrific over the past uh, six years. They've kept their rates artificially low over the past five years. You know, half of what the market is there, uh, and so we basically, you know, the you know the the deal was essentially getting both parties to agree that we're going to that we're going to sell. We had to close the private portion first, and then it took us some time to get the city's portion closed. We had an operator lined up already that we've already pre-negotiated a triple net lease with an operator that manages you know fifty plus parking assets down along the beaches, and so very familiar with that marketplace. And so, it, you know, we. A lot of the value add was done in the year that it took us, you know, from the initial conversation to the actual closing of the deal. Most of the value add happened in that span of time. You know, it, you know it being of, of, of negotiating with both the city and the private, and also getting that that private operator, that local operator, in place for that triple net lease. And so, um, we're excited about it. It's only six years old. I mean, it's a fairly new structure. I mean, which isn't that common in the parking space mm-hmm. um, to find a, a garage that's only six years old that's actually available for sale in a great location. Right. Um, and uh, so, anyway, we're, we're super excited about it. It's a it's a phenomenal deal. It's uh, you know kicking off a ton of cash flow, and um, and there's still a good bit of upside there for that operator stepping in. And uh, they they've instituted some dynamic pricing. You know, the prior uh, operator that worked for the city and the private developer literally just had three dollars an hour. Didn't have any flat rate pricing for you know events 
holiday weekends at the beach, 4th of July, things of that nature. They, it just kept at $3 an hour all the time. So they had a lot of meat left on the bone for that new operator to step in. And they're excited about it. They're happy. We're happy. And it's just been a phenomenal deal all the way around. I love that asset class. That's really cool. And, I, and, I, and I'm pumped to see you guys uh, you know, doing well with that. that. That's a lot of fun. I think that's, uh, you know, again, a unique asset class. And it's cool. You're finding those opportunities. I've certainly seen same thing, you know, those public private partnerships. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, we we even had an opportunity at one point, they brought us a bunch of garages to build, but their underwritten pro formas were just so, so far off. It was like, guys, you can't, it's just never going to work. Like, no, we, we, yeah, we actually got a hold of the pro forma that the consultant provided the city prior to the development of the garage. And yeah. like, there wasn't one year where it actually hit that. But again, most, uh, most of that was because the city basically of the seven floors of the parking deck, the private developer owned the first, they owned the first two in the retail right? Uh, and the seventh. And then the city owned four or five or, or three, four, five, and six. Well, in normal times, the first two floors got the majority of the traffic, sure. you know? And, and, and so, and they, they, proportionally speaking, they actually shared the expenses proportionate to their ownership. And so the, the private developer only owned 252 spaces, the city owned whatever the number is, you know, 450 or 460. Anyway, so they, they, they proportionally paid much more than expenses, but right. had way less revenue. I mean, it was a bit, again, Bad. kudos to the private developer for the negotiations on the front end because they did a phenomenal job. But unfortunately, the city got the short end of the stick and um, it just never, ever met their projections. Right. And I mean, these the, the, the city doesn't know parking. That's not their business. No, so they like, should have bought. The city should have actually bought the other. That's what they should have done. But they are already so far in the water and they just they had another big project happening. They just wanted to take their their millions and you know, redeploy it into the other project. They, they, they didn't want to have any any discussions about buying the other you know, the other part of the parking. So obviously we were the guys with the capes on and came in and, and <laughs> saved the day. Good for you. <laughs> I love it. Love that story. Kevin, thank you for coming on the show today and, and sharing with us everything you guys are getting involved in, where you see the mobile home park space right now, how you guys are uh, you know, d- 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 crushing it in parking, and then you know the opportunity you guys see in the build-to-rent market there in Phoenix. I love it. You've shared with us a ton of information certainly appreciate it. If our listeners want to get in touch with you or learn more about you, what is the best way to do that? Yeah, they can go to kevinbup.com. Uh, you can contact me there. Uh, if you want to learn about Sunrise Capital Investors, which is our investment arm, you can go to Invest with Sunrise. And then, uh, Sam, if you don't mind, I actually just released a book too. I'd love to give a free copy yeah. away to your, your listeners. Uh, they can go to kevinbup.com forward slash free book, and you can see it on the screen behind me. I don't know if we do this in video or not, but- yep. It's called The Cash Flow Investor. It's about building wealth in commercial real estate. And again, they can grab a free copy by going to kevinbup.com forward slash free book. Awesome. And we'll certainly include that there in the show notes as well. And yeah, this will be on YouTube as well for those watching it on YouTube. So Kevin, thank you again for coming on. I certainly appreciate it. Sam, thanks for having me. It's been fun.